Hello, hello. Welcome back. This is an episode that I've been looking forward to recording for a while now because so many of you express interest in hearing about the things that I have done to improve my own sleep. I'm going to be honest, I've tried a lot of things to improve my sleep over the past two years as I've been very focused on improving my overall health, and sleep is a big part of that. The list of things I've tried is long. In fact, when we were planning this episode, I was chatting with Beth, who is my right-hand woman and produces this podcast, and I was telling her all the things that I've tried. I mean, I didn't even get to all of them. I was just listing off a bunch of things I've tried and tracked related to my sleep. She just started laughing because it's a lot and would definitely be overwhelming to the average person who isn't as obsessed with sleep as I am. It's true that a lot of things can factor into our sleep quality, but the good news is that there are definitely just a handful of things that I now know are the biggest drivers for me when it comes to my sleep. So everyone's is going to be a little bit different, but I am really excited to share that I have found the big drivers. While I'm happy to talk about all the things that I've tried in future episodes, if that's of interest to you all, today I'm just going to focus on the five things that I know I can do that will ensure that I get an amazing night of sleep. Before I dive in, however, I have a huge favor to ask. This is our 25th episode, which is very exciting because that means we are one episode away from this podcast being six months old. If you've been enjoying How Long Till Bedtime, could you please pause this episode and take just a second to rate and review the podcast on Apple or Spotify? Thanks a million. Hi, I'm Allison Edgity, a pediatric sleep and wellness coach and a mom of two. I love to help parents find solutions. This is How Long Till Bedtime. If you've been around for a while, you know that I care as much about your health and well being as I do about your child's. I am passionate about teaching babies and young children how to have healthy sleep habits and to get the sleep that they need to thrive and be their very best little selves for so many reasons. And one of those reasons is that when our children sleep well, we have the opportunity to sleep well. Sleep is so critical for our health. My family often says that I know too much about sleep, so much that it stresses them out and at times it has stressed me out. I will admit that as I became more and more educated on sleep, I did start to stress about my bad nights of sleep. I would literally lay awake and think about how I was definitely going to end up with Alzheimer's because I was getting less than seven hours of sleep so many nights in a row. I have a little anxiety I deal with as well, and not getting good sleep affects that. So, of course, lying awake thinking about getting Alzheimer's does not help me with my sleep. I do not want this episode to stress you out, because I know from personal experience that being stressed about sleep isn't helpful. So I'm not going to dive into all the dozens of reasons that I really want you to prioritize and care about your sleep. I will, however, share a few that specifically relate to parenting that I'd like you to consider. First, for those of you with a baby under the age of one who are struggling, getting uninterrupted sleep is the number one and least expensive way to start feeling better. I can tell you from personal experience that my postpartum anxiety improved very quickly after I started getting more consolidated sleep. If you're interested in hearing about my best strategies for new parents to get longer stretches of sleep, even if your baby isn't sleeping through the night, be sure to listen to episode 15. Second, parenting is much easier after a good night of sleep. I hope I'm not alone here, but I know that I am much more present and patient after I've had a solid night of sleep. Third, 
prioritizing your sleep is one of the best ways to help you stay healthy and live longer. So while I won't dive into all the negative things that can result from being chronically sleep deprived, I will tell you that when I need to parent myself, which I'll talk more about in this episode, (laughs) I simply now just remind myself that one of my goals is to live a long and healthy life so that I can see my girls grow up and that I can then meet and play with my grandchildren. So I just kind of stick to that idea when I'm having trouble keeping myself accountable or holding myself accountable to following my healthy sleep habits. On the topic of parenting myself, I want to acknowledge that it is not always easy to prioritize my sleep. The evenings are when we parents are getting things done, spending time with our partners, unwinding, having alone time, etc. Sometimes I literally feel like I need to parent myself in order to keep my good sleep habits. Adulting is hard (laughs) and by no means am I perfect, but with practice, I have to say I'm getting better and I'm getting more consistent and I'm starting to crave those good nights of sleep. In part, it's because I've started to see the noticeable benefits. So it can take time. One last thing before I dive in. Part of the reason I've been able to truly nail down the key drivers for a good night of sleep is because I've been tracking my sleep daily now for 15 months. I wear the whoop and it's been a game changer for me as it relates to my sleep. So if you're not familiar with the whoop, it's something that I wear around my wrist. It's kind of like a watch, although there's nothing to see on it. It tracks many stats related to my health that I can view in an app. But the one that I'll be talking most about here today is the sleep recovery score. Obviously, the ideal is to have a sleep recovery that's 100%. But a score between 67 and 100% indicates that you've had a good recovery that sets you up to take on the day. A recovery between 34 to 66% would indicate that your body could be compromised and hasn't had the best recovery. And a recovery score of 33% or below indicates a very poor recovery. The highest score I've ever gotten is 98%. You guys are going to hear about it when I hit 100. And ideally, I personally shoot to have 85% or higher. Now, I want to be clear that I do not think the WHOOP is for everyone. For it to be accurate, you really need to wear it all the time, which you, A, may not want to do. And also, I want to note that, you know, it could be stressful for some people to have all this data. Because even when I first started wearing it, it started to stress me out when I would see my terrible sleep scores. However, it ultimately allowed me to nail down what actually was messing with my sleep and what I could do to improve it. If you're interested in trying out the Whoop, I do have a referral link that would get you the free Whoop and one free month. I'll share that in the show notes if you want to look into it. All right, here we go. This first thing is huge for me. And I would say that now that I have my good sleep habits nailed down, this is one that I really notice if I sidestep I know that I am not going to have a recovery over 80%. In fact, it's going to typically knock my recovery down into the 60s or lower, even if this was the only place I sidestepped. And that is eating after 7.30 p.m. Now, if you're someone who likes to have dessert or a snack after you've put your kids to bed, this one can be a bit of a drag and it can require a noticeable lifestyle change. For us, because our girls go to bed pretty early, we're typically done with dinner by 7 p.m. at the latest. And if I want to get a great night of sleep, that's the end of my eating for the day. A side note on the food topic, about two years ago, I dropped gluten as kind of an experiment after getting diagnosed with Hashimoto's and kind of reading about the effects gluten can have on that. And after being off of gluten for two months, I did experiment with eating gluten again and quickly realized it makes me feel terrible. So I didn't know I had an issue with it before, but once I took a break, my body 
would scream when I would eat it. So while this is pretty specific to my personal food intolerances, I will note here that if I accidentally eat gluten or eat food at a restaurant that's been cross-contaminated with gluten, my recovery will absolutely tank down into the 40s or lower. The reason I share this little tidbit is to note one of the benefits of learning about your own food intolerances is figuring out that it can really help with your sleep. So if you're eating foods that are constantly irritating or putting your system under stress, it can mess with your body's ability to rest and recover. But most importantly, if you haven't gotten that far yet, I recommend trying out not eating particularly anything with sugar after dinner and ideally not eating in the two and a half to three hours before going to bed. I'll share a recent example of me cheating on this rule. My husband was out of town a couple of weeks ago and the introvert in me was just enjoying my alone time. I was having my little alone party. I was watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I highly recommend if you haven't watched it yet. And I suddenly decided I'm going to treat myself to a little dessert here for my party of one. And I had this really small gluten-free, dairy-free ice cream bar around 9 p.m. I went to sleep without a problem around 10 p.m. And I slept straight through the night without remembering being up at all until about 6.15 in the morning. I looked at my recovery when I got up and it was 44%. After eight hours of sleep. That sugar I had close to bedtime, it totally tanked my sleep. So it's happened before. This just happens to be a recent memory. And hopefully I will resist that urge the next time I think about eating a late night dessert while I'm sitting on my couch. Okay, the second thing that impacts my sleep is kind of related to the first, and that's alcohol. Now, I know we all hear that alcohol negatively affects our sleep. This is not something new, but I've actually pinned down the specifics for my body. If I have one to two drinks before 7.30 p.m., my sleep actually isn't negatively impacted. A third drink, even if it's early, or a drink after 7.30 p.m. will definitely screw with my recovery score, and it will fragment my sleep as well. So, In the evening, I might have a cup of tea after I put the kids to bed, but other than that, on a typical day, once we're done with dinner, I do the same thing that I do with food. I don't consume any drinks, particularly alcohol, other than tea, and I really stick to water in that dinner to bedtime window. Now, I just want to be clear that I'm not advocating for drinking one to two drinks a day, and even one drink may impact some people's sleep. I'm just sharing how alcohol affects my sleep. And by no means does this mean that I never eat or drink after 7.30 p.m., but now that I truly understand how eating and drinking later in the evening impacts my sleep... I am now much more intentional about when I do do it. I don't stress about going out to a later dinner with friends or having a glass of wine out on the patio because it's not the majority of my nights. I mean, last night is a perfect example. I went to play pickleball with some friends and the lights on the court weren't working. So we did the completely logical thing and decided to go have a glass of wine instead. I had a glass of rosé around 8.30, came home, meditated to help with my wind down process, went to sleep, slept for seven hours, looked at my recovery this morning. It was 66%. So not a disaster. And I'm not stressed about last night. I had a lovely time chatting with the ladies. And part of the reason I'm not stressed is because I know exactly what caused that less than stellar recovery. And I will prioritize watching what I eat and drink on the average typical nights at home. And I'll know that these nights are not that often and it's going to be okay. The third thing that helps drive my recovery over the 85% goal that I have is meditation. And if you're anything like the Allison of 2020 and before, you're currently rolling your eyes thinking, oh, here we go again. Someone's going to talk about meditation. 
Listen, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I resisted meditation for years. I finally did it specifically to see if the sleep data would improve after I started wearing the whoop. And you guys, the data doesn't lie. So while it's, it is getting easier for me, I will say that I still think I'm pretty terrible at meditation. My mind wanders. I feel distracted sometimes. It still works for me. Even on those times where I think I didn't do a very great job at that, it works. The numbers show that it works. And I've never done a meditation longer than 10 minutes. And again, it still works. I will tell you that the only times my recovery has been in the 90s is if I've meditated the day before. Interestingly enough, it seems to help my sleep no matter what time of day I do the meditation. I've done a little experimenting around this. I could do it first thing in the morning, midday, or before bedtime, and it all seems to benefit my sleep. But what I have noticed is that if I'm doing something in the evening that energizes me, like I have client calls or I lead a coaching call or I go play pickleball with my friends on those nights, I will have a hard time winding down and then doing the five to 10 minute meditation really does help me get ready for sleep. And my sleep scores are always better. So if I've been active in the evening, I do see benefit to doing that meditation before bedtime, even if I did a meditation earlier in the day. So if you're already on the meditation train, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that I recommend meditation. If you're not on the train yet, try it. I recommend starting with a five to 10 minute sleep meditation. I mean, when I first started, I would just do them laying down in my bed. I just started with bedtime meditations. Now those are actually are not my favorite. I'll do them sitting up um, often right before bedtime but I will do them sitting up and then get into bed. But I also really like to try to do them earlier in the day because I see benefits for how I feel throughout the day. I personally take meditation classes on Peloton. If you've been around, you know I love Peloton. I will link to a free 60-day pass in the show notes if that's of interest to try out. But there are plenty of free guided meditations out there. Headspace is a popular app that has some free, uh, a free version that you can certainly try. The fourth and fifth things are actually probably the hardest two for me and really require me to parent myself the most. The fourth is not listening to anything other than possibly a meditation while I'm falling asleep. This is actually really hard for me because I grew up falling asleep listening to music. I would have my little clock radio with the music on and I'd have the 30 minute timer set. And so I always fell asleep listening to music. And despite popular belief, falling asleep to music isn't a good idea. While it might feel like it helps you fall asleep, it actually might help you fall asleep. Newer research shows that it stimulates the brain and it could keep your brain in a more active state, which can result in you spending more time in light sleep and you being more likely to wake up during the night. So while I no longer have this desire to fall asleep to music, my long history of doing that makes it so that I have a constant desire to fall asleep listening to something like a podcast, a book on tape, or watching a show. I've done my own experiments on myself to track this. I like to really do these little deep dives into these different areas to see how it all plays out. And again, the the data doesn't lie. Falling asleep listening to something causes me to have night wakings where I once again want to listen to something, which I find so interesting. If I fall asleep not listening to something and I wake up, I don't have this instant feeling of like, oh, I want to listen to that podcast again, or I need to listen to something to get back to sleep. If I fall asleep listening to something, the second I wake up, it's like my brain's like, well, where'd it go? You need that thing. And I will have a very strong desire to get back to listening to it. And not only that, my recovery numbers drop. I mean, they are noticeably lower. And I think a big piece of that is because I spend more time in light sleep, even if I don't have a lot of fragmentation. 
So one of the ways I've helped myself as far as parenting myself in this particular area is actually removing the TV from our bedroom. This, there were so many things I had to overcome that this was one thing that I thought I can make this go away. So I think at this point, we've all heard that blue light affects melatonin production. So I won't dive into that other than to say, yes, it's true. Screens can mess up your sleep. So the TV was a double whammy. It was a screen and it was me falling asleep listening to something. I could tell you that my husband was not thrilled when I removed the TV. And in his defense, I don't think we really had a conversation about it. I just decided we were done with it and took it down. Um, And in fact, I should just note that He also wears the whoop and his bad sleep scores have not resulted in him changing his sleep habits. He still loves to eat dessert um, after the kids are in bed when he's relaxing in the evening and he always falls asleep watching something on the iPad, like guaranteed. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. I haven't won him over, but maybe I'll win some of you over. (laughs) So speaking of the iPad, The last thing that helps improve my sleep score is keeping my iPad and my cell phone out of the bedroom. Obviously, the blue light can affect melatonin production, um, and the use of the phone can also just delay me falling asleep at an ideal time. It just keeps me awake longer because it's stimulating. I will also say that having it next to my bed, it can tempt me when I wake up during the night. Like, it's right there. It's just reach over and look at it or turn it on to listen to a podcast or something. So I even noticed that I am more likely to wake if it's next to my bed, even if I didn't use it when I was falling asleep, even if I wasn't playing with it when I was in bed or listening to anything, I feel like it still causes night wakings for me. And I've looked into this and it's still pretty debatable out there around whether or not electromagnetic fields related to our cell phones disrupt our sleep, I personally think it does disrupt my sleep. So even just having the phone on my bedside table is an issue for my sleep. Now, I certainly have had plenty of good nights of sleep with high recovery scores when the phone has been on my bedside table, but they are consistently better and higher if I leave the phone in the bathroom. So if you're struggling with your sleep, This is a hard one. It takes some self-parenting, but I suggest trying to keep the phone out of your bedroom. Try reading a good old-fashioned book before you go to bed and see if your sleep improves. Well, there you have it. While many things can affect our sleep, if I want to ensure I have a pretty darn restorative seven to eight hours of sleep, I know that I can prioritize these five things and count on getting a high recovery score. It's not always easy. I mean, let's be honest, adulting is hard sometimes, but I do love how I feel after a great night of sleep. I'm definitely a better parent and I'm much more productive. So these are five things you can experiment with and see how do you sleep? Try one at a time. Obviously, I've now looped them all together, but I really tested out one at a time and then would build on any improvement I had. So you could start by trying some of these five. Obviously, there's a ton of other things you could try, but I would encourage you to start to try to nail down what helps you get a great night of sleep. If you try any of these recommendations, or if you've already found the secret sauce for improving your sleep, I would actually love to hear about it. Shoot me a DM on Instagram at sleep and wellness coach. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Cheers to more sleep, my friend. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to how long till bedtime to learn how we can work together to improve your child's sleep please visit sleepandwellnesscoach.com.